interesting group of people. Uh, they call themselves the Hazaf Theater. Uh, part of what they do is they take oral histories, which is, uh, they found some elderly folks, and they take their life stories, and they record them, and they interpret them, and they turn them into a dramatic presentation. And tonight we've got the uh, pleasure of seeing one of their uh, one of their original productions called Alice and Eugene and Forgotten Years. Um, I'm looking forward to it. It should be something new for us. I uh, really hope you enjoy it. And uh, I'd be love I'd love to hear your feedback when it's all said and done. Uh, please sit back and enjoy the show. Thank you. show. At this time, please turn off your cell phones. We are the Hazaf Theater Truth, and the performance you are about to see is part of our Live Forever project. The mission of the Live Forever project is to illuminate history through a personal lens by preserving and sharing true stories through artistic expression. We aim to keep memories alive. Our current focus is World War II and the Great Depression. Today you will experience stories based on our interviews with two people who lived through World War II. Eugene Hilke, from Manitowoc, Wisconsin, who was stationed with the National Guard, 32nd Division, 127th Infantry, E Company, in the South Pacific. He fought in New Guinea, an island north of Australia. You'll also experience stories from the life of Alice Green, from Manitowoc, Wisconsin, as someone who experienced the effects and implications of the war on the home front. Our performance is a collection of different pieces in various art forms that depict these stories. The play you are about to see is original work created by the Hazaa Theater Troupe. Without further ado, the Hazaa Theater Troupe Live Forever Project presents Alice and Eugene, the lucky ones. <coughs> Please save your applause for intermission and the end of the show.
Um, no. You don't have to. I can get it. Where's Grandma? She's in the bedroom resting. Her back isn't bothering her. Oh. Is that because of the accident? I suppose your mom and dad told you about that. Yeah, they told me. I'm glad you guys are all right now, though. We were lucky this time. And just not as good behind the steering wheel as they used to be. All of a sudden, we're staying off the road, and this was a close call. But I've dealt that a lot in the past. What do you mean? Well, when I was in service, we had many close calls. Oh, right. I remember I used to talk about that when I was a kid, but I can't remember any of the stories now. Well, that's all right. I have a hard time remembering them anymore. That was many years ago, and my memory's not what it used to be. Well, that's all right. I just want to know what it was like for you. Well, all right. Great. The facts might be jumbled. That's all right. <laughs> Let's see. When I was of age, I joined the service. It was about 1940, and it ended up I served almost until the very end of the war. I trained for quite some time, and I was stationed for more to New Guinea. Wow. When you first started, did you think you would be in the war that long? No. Each step of the way, we thought, something's going to happen, we'll turn around and head home. But things kept moving forward. National Guard. Two dollars a week, it shouldn't be too hard. I'll serve my term, six months and no more, cause I'm not really going to war. trip. 
And every day we wake up, there would be a new sea. There would be rough seas, mild seas, and very gentle seas. We were on the water for 23 days and saw no land in that time. And every day, everyone on the vessel would say, waft her, waft her everywhere, but not a drop to drink. Finally, we arrived in Adelaide, Australia, which is the southern part of Australia. And from that point, we boarded a train and we moved to the Brisbane area. And we left for Port Morrison, New Guinea. And it was a dark, ominous day. And we all wonder what we were in for. tunnel of eight-foot grass. Rays of sun split shadow in half. Soldiers' wounds burden native backs. How many living, how many passed? How much damage? Who will be next? Eyes in the trees and in the reeds, burning holes in the soles of my feet. Was this the plan when Lucifer fell? If I had to choose New Guinea or hell, when sunlight fades and moonlight rains, my blood turns thickly in my veins. I shut my lids, but I don't sleep. Can't see the weeds stare back at me. Matted fur and eyes like beads. I cringe under the weight of tiny feet. A jerk and a shiver from through my back. What else lingers in the grass? Beast or boots? I can't tell. If I had to choose New Guinea or hell? Beware, black water is poisonous. And the pills we pop to keep death at bay make our eyes droop and our minds decay. And it all goes dark, but just as well. If I had to choose New Guinea or hell, I'd live in hell. I'd live in hell. I'd live in hell. I live in hell. I live in hell. <coughs> and rent out New Guinea. Yeah. <laughs> Are you sure you'll be able to find something? 
projectors packed like planes. It was during the night when I heard explosions, and I got out of my pup tent. And the battle itself was terrible, but prettier than heck. Terrible. Prettier than heck. Hey, Yogi. Do you have anything? Are you ready? 
I have everything I need, but I'll never be ready for this. I know what you mean, but everyone gets that feeling. I don't know, Hilke. I think it's different this time. I just get this feeling like, like I'm really not going to make it out of it this time. You'll see, Floyd. We'll do what we have to do, and we'll make it. Right. Scariest things? I saw many scary things. Many horrible, gruesome things. I don't like to think about them. Abandoned, bloated buoy, rusting in the sun. Half of an empty time capsule, cradled in the surf. The sunken eyes of a moth-eaten rag doll. An ageless, raceless depression. In the restless, <coughs> reaching <coughs> water. The ominous creeping other, now our brother. Whose face is this? song. drink. He looks ill. He looks sick. Whose face is this? Gruesome. I know you, an ancient ghost who eats the soul and leaves the bones. You impose and insist. 
exist. A will no one can resist. You take the eyes, the skin, the mind, until you create a mirror image. You wait in trees, and in water, and in reeds, and in the hearts of men. Death, this is your face. These are your hands. Gruesome. 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 to my memory. We were on the beach, and nearby there was a cluster of trees, and the ocean came up to them. At the cluster of trees, the waves came up to the root system, and you could lie behind those two trees and look between them, down the beach and over towards the jungle. That ended up to be kind of a hot spot. A number of guys got shot there. So we learned that we had to shy away from that place. Because in training you learn that if there are places that are hot, you use tactics and you go someplace else. Well, it just so happened that we had a new commanding officer because our old one had put in for a transfer. This new officer happened to be there at the time and he volunteered to command our company. And he didn't know his ass from a hole in the ground. He really didn't. He didn't know what's parts of a machine gun were which, and he was calling them by the wrong names and such. And he insisted that someone should go down by those two trees where all the men got shot. Because the trees stuck out into the water and you could maybe peek around one of them and shoot a little bit further down this way. That's why he wanted a machine gun there. So, Cunningham from Texas and I, we hop skipped down to that hot spot. Now we knew where the shooting would be coming from, and we didn't want to expose ourselves. So we hopped, skipped, and we jumped, and we used the protection of the higher ground. And finally, we got down to that hot spot. And pretty soon, pow, a bullet came, hit the ground, sand sprayed in our face. Pow, another bullet, sand sprayed in our face. And we were trying to make a spot for the machine gun to set the machine gun in. And the sniper was still shooting, but he was missing us. And I didn't want to say it, so I was glad when Cunningham said, God darn it, Hilke, that son of a bitch can't miss forever. So we decided to get the hell out of there. So he hopped, skipped, tumbled, and rolled. And once he was done, I hopped, skipped, tumbled, and rolled. We went back to that commanding officer who sent us there. And we told him that that was a hot spot. We said it's covered by a sniper, and he shouldn't send anyone else down there. And lo and behold, if he doesn't ask machine gunners from G Company to go down to that spot. And they didn't know about that being a hot spot. And we tried to shout to them. We said, hey guys, guys, get down. This spot's covered by a sniper. But they couldn't hear. And pretty soon, pow, pow, and then pow. And that third one, that third one sounded a little bit different. There was this little red-headed guy among those men. And someone shouted back, real hysterical, Hey! They got red! They got red! I don't know why it bothers me so much. Because I'm telling you about it. He was the only one I ever saw who was real hysterical. Like, I, I was really his buddy, you know? So I blame that commanding officer for that death. I can think about it many, many times. Because I'm telling you about it. That's what makes me break down. We can stop for a while if you want. 
All right. Was there a time during the war where you experienced joy, even though you were going through a lot of hardship? One morning, when I had chosen a shallow depression in the ground as my place to sleep, I woke up and I found something there in the grass that I never, ever expected to find.
that same place was a spot on the beach, Una Beach, where the Japanese hit us with a surprise attack. Me and this fella from another platoon had to take cover as fast as we could, so we dove down behind this eight-inch crest of sand, just high enough to cover our heads. It ends up that he didn't make it out. And sometime later, when I was at home, I opened up an issue of Life magazine. And lo and behold, there was a picture of that dead soldier laying on the beach. And it was such a strange feeling to think that I laid next to that soldier in the magazine when he died. They must have come after it was done. Reporters with their picture guns.
no idea if people would believe my story. But I cut that picture out of Life magazine, and I have it till this day. Wow. It had to have been quite a feeling. Yeah, it was. I'm ready for the next question. All right. Now I'm wondering about what happened after the war. How did people treat you? I was surprised at how I was treated. I remember, I rode home on a train. And the train was so crowded. A hot-down train headed for my town. I was a soldier, a homeward bound. I looked for a seat, and there was no space. That's when I saw the stranger's face. He said, where have you been? And where are you headed for? He said, I'm a soldier back from the war. And that's when I saw a change on his face. And to my surprise, he got up from his place and said,
tell you a thing or two about Frankie. Okay. That's disgusting! Mm. Oh. Do you want him over here? <laughs> no! <laughs> I didn't think so. So how about both of you help me get back to work? Fine. Okay. Um, Alice? Yep. I think I see Frankie. I just oh told him not to joke around about that. Oh my gosh. This is not a drill! Look oh what you did. What do we do? 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 I'd find Alice over here. I really like Alice. She's so pretty and such a good listener. I could talk to her all day. And I've been hearing about how much she likes me. Yeah, we're all saying that. Yep, I keep an eye on that one. She definitely has a thing for you.
Yes, in the factory, I would make equipment for the soldiers. We all worked very hard. But you know, there were also those nice times in between it all. Like playing baseball. They had local teams for girls, and they were looking for girls to play ball. So we played ball. Can I trade it in for a new tube? <coughs> oh. Oh. I have too much to carry. I have to leave this behind. Where 
Would you like to walk to today? Didn't inspire me or give me thoughts anyway. My mother worked part time at something, and my mom, my father also worked. You know, we just took everything as a matter of course. Like, say you couldn't get this thing because it was rationed. Well, that's it. You can't get it. It was the way it was. And if there was any fear, it didn't manifest itself outwardly. It was just an era in our lives that we have. Like your eras are high school and then college and everything like that. Well, we didn't have that just seemed like a plain humdrum life. Not much events, really. Now all the events are happening in a different people's lives. Younger people. And that's the way. Grandma, when you were in school, did you know anyone that died? Yes. <coughs> My classmates died. David Herman. Joseph Todd. Donald Schmidt. Andrew Miller. our togetherness. And it hits me harder now than it did back then. Families had children who were in the war, and whatever would happen would be an acceptance. And that was our part in the war.
seconds from colliding, holding your breath to stop time. 15 seconds from white water, cling to a paddle for dear life. You are 23 days from battle in a tin can on fickle seas. A new horizon every day, you wait, free fall splash, water, water everywhere, but never a drop to drink. Eat, sleep, pray, play, live, die. Don't blink. Don't blink. Hello. 
experienced and given so much in your lives. And I'm afraid that people aren't even going to know that these stories happen. But there's still so much that we can learn from them about who we are and who we want to be. And then I'm afraid they're going to get lost in time. Because, well, you and Grandpa are getting older and you're not in the best of health. And I just, I don't know what I can do with that. Well, I don't think it's that important that people know our stories. We're just living our lives. But they are important. And they can get lost in time. That's what, that's just how time works. None of us can help that. Well, that can't be. Just, just can't be.
about you? Oh, all good things, I hope. <laughs> yeah, I was telling Grandma how to make sure people know your stories. Awesome. So what have you been telling her about today? Well, I was telling her about when we first met. Oh, did you tell her about the day we first met? No, I didn't. You should tell her. Well, I had this buddy in the Army, and his name was Jimmy Green. And it just so happened that Jimmy and I were wounded at about the same time. But Jimmy was hurt just a little bit before I was. So we were both headed home to heal up, stopping at different hospitals along the way. And the way it worked out, Jimmy was already always one hospital ahead of me. I could never quite catch up with him. By the time I got to the hospital he was in, darn it, he was already on to the next one. But eventually we both got home, and I decided to go pay Jimmy Green a visit. Little did I know that when I went to see Jimmy Green, I would meet his little sister, Alice Green. Oh, that was a very strange and special day. I see a big white pillow on the hospital bed. There's a big white crater when you rest in your head. Hey, Jimmy Green, guess I missed you again. Should have planned a good shot at the same time, my friend. Hopscotch in hospitals, you always want me for. But I met you at the finish line, a visit home from war. When I met your sister on that strange and special day Easter Sunday, April 1st, 1945 I went out with Jimmy to unwind And Alice said that she would come if we didn't mind When we left, she tag along behind Hey, Jimmy Green, I could have missed her Hey, Jimmy Green, just met your little sister Hey, Jimmy Green, I could have missed her Hey, Jimmy Green she sends to me. I unfold the paper and I read it eagerly. Hey, Jimmy Green, can't wait to see her again. Wish I could come home. More all thing, my friend. Finally, one day, we figured why wait. We visited the priest and he set a wedding date. Hey, Jimmy Green, don't you know I stopped the car? And I gave her a diamond ring on the wall the Boulevard. Easter Sunday, April 1st, 1945. I went out with Jimmy to unwind. And Alice said that she would come if we didn't mind. When we left, she tagged along behind. Hey, Jimmy Green, I could have missed her. Hey, Jimmy Green, I love your little sister. Hey, Jimmy Green, I could have missed her. Hey, Jimmy Green, I love your little sister. We had a wartime wedding, just two friends and us. In the office of the priest, no fanciness, no fuss. Hey, Jimmy Green, we can move away from home. And she and I can start a life out there on our own. Easter Sunday, April 1st, 1945. I went out with Jimmy to unwind. And Alice said that she would come if we didn't mind. When we left, she tagged along behind.
up working out. And here we are. We were lucky. We've always been lucky. Thank you. 